Greetings, you've landed at the VUC, IP Communications and VoIP Community. We would like to thank Simwood.com for their support. Simwood can turn you as a developer into a telco. Our host at PBX is from OnSIP.com. You can go to GetOnSIP.com for a URL people can click to call you. We've been privileged over the last five years to be using the best conference bridge on the planet. Yes, I'm talking about ZipDX.com, full-color, full-featured, full-HD conference bridge. Our website, VUC.me on the web, is hosted by Bluehost.com. And our worldwide local rate dialers are from Voxbone.com. All right, you heard it first here. This is VUC 589 for April 15th, 2016. Our guest today, he said, looking at his script is Tom. She's right. Tom, welcome. We're going to introduce you in a second, but I want to put you on and say welcome to you. Thank you very much. Okay, and I am what I'm going to do besides turning my own camera on, there we go, and maybe I should put the text in. There we go. So if you go to republicofthings.com, we're going to be repeating that a few times during this chat, and I'm going to turn it over to Tim to uh, ask the question about how Tom got into all this stuff and also to introduce him and talk a little bit about him because Tom's way too modest to introduce himself in all its glory. So go ahead, Tim. Well, I, I'm sure Tom will do a better job than I, I will. I'm actually trying to remember where we first met. Um, obviously, it was in Manchester, but we were, there was some, yeah, there was some startup event or something, and Tom foolishly agreed to do PR for me for a competition that we were doing, um, we were going in for, and, uh, and I, I had no clue about what I was doing, and Tom somehow fixed it so that we won. Um, I, it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain it's to do with the quality of the products and not the PR, but you know. Um, but no, to, Tom's, Tom's always been, um, been interested in interesting things and, and had a, a view somewhat ahead of most of us, um, but in a kind of rather more pragmatic way than, than many of the geeks that surround him. Anyway, so um, Tom is a, yeah, perfectly capable of speaking for himself. Thank you. <laughs> um, although, actually, I should say, the, the thing we do, the boring, repetitive question we always ask in this, just because it's like, it's turned into a habit now, but it's kind of amusing sometimes, is um, what got you into tech? You, you, were you born with a soldering iron in your hand, or did you hate it until you discovered <laughs> mending kettles at university, or what? what what's the story? I think the answer partly comes from the year I was born. I was born in 78, so I think my mum watched the Star Wars trilogy while I was a still insider, and I seem to pop out obsessed with science fiction and the future and technology. And there's a particular book after which my, my primary business at the moment is named The Book of the Future, an Usborne publication from 1979 that she bought me. And I still actually have a dog-eared copy on the shelf just next to me, um, which was all about the way the world was going to be kind of by about now, um, and um, you can see by the state of the book just how many times I read it, but between growing up reading that, uh, watching Star Wars probably a thousand times, and actually a dad who was a bit of a geek, um, who was you know playing around with the uh, predecessors to spreadsheets on a Commodore PET in the 1970s, and uh, kept bringing you know, BB micros and various other things for us to play with, I've pretty much always been some form of geek. Um, albeit not necessarily the most competent one, despite a, a degree in mechatronic engineering. So I think the thing that's kind of interesting is that you've, you've strayed out from pure geekdom and, and headed out into doing into communication, so, and not, not with electrons, but with, with voice and, and speech and gestures and whatever, and actually trying to you know, interpret the future for real people. And that, that's a... Um, a rare gift and kind of interesting to see how, how did that transition happen? How did, how did you sort of kind of fall into being a communicator rather than... Um... I guess it's, I, I was always a bit of a jack of all trades and uh, I was obsessed by technology and that drove what I thought was going to be my career right up until I got to university. Um, I did, did you know the, the classic kind of science A levels, went into the, my engineering degree 
and then kind of life got in the way a little bit. You know, I discovered things like students' unions and women probably pay a significant part in this and spent a lot of time campaigning for various elections and things and did my first pieces of PR and marketing. And then when I came to leave university, I, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. I knew I probably wasn't good enough at maths to be a real engineer. Um, so it was a question of looking around for what appealed to me. And I, I actually applied for four jobs based on the strength of this. Uh, and one of them happened to be for a tech PR, a tech marketing agency, uh, who at the time were working for some microsystems and not long after flipped over for working for uh, um, for IBM and uh, Solus Networks, who would be familiar to a lot of people. And um, yeah, I went there and within about a week they realized that they had this guy who could speak the language of the engineers on most of the history of the and they could parachute him into a room in Finland or Boston or wherever it was and give me the brief of translating what the techies were saying into something they could actually sell. And that was kind of my role for the next five years. Go and be the bridge between the engineers and the real people. <laughs> and uh, you know, translate what they were saying into something the rest of us understand, and importantly, something the rest of us understand. Yeah, I, I, I now have, a, a, have on my business card protocol droid, um, precisely because I think both aspects of that are important. The ability to write kind of geeky protocols is, is, is critical, but also the ability to translate from, you know, tech speak to, um, to human speak in a, in a way that kind of people get the message slightly. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically now channeling C3PO. Um, and that's why you get the call when I can't do the BBC slots. <laughs> right, right, right. Although they tend to be, I, I suspect that there's something to do with the time in the morning as well. But, you know. <laughs> so tell us about Republic of Things. I mean, I, I kind of vaguely know what's going on there, but, but I don't think anybody else does. So tell us the story there, what, what's happening. So the Republic of Things I got involved with when a friend of mine who's a kind of chairman, uh, an investor, um, he, he'd helped me quite a lot with um, my last startup, which was a, a software analytics business, um, and in, in coaching me through the pitching process for that. And he rang me up. I clearly owed him a favour and said, "Will you come and have a look at this business for me? Um, it sounds kind of interesting, but I don't really know whether it's real or a pipe dream." Uh, and there was a very enthusiastic founder behind it, a guy called Andrew Beechner, uh, who'd, who'd already founded one uh, hosting and telco type business. And, and had this idea about setting up a, a, a true platform for the Internet of Things. And my, my, I have to say, I was initially skeptical. You know, there's so many of the individual components of what might be an Internet of Things platform are out there. You know, there seems to be endless pieces of hardware popping up on Kickstarters. You can buy huge amounts of stuff cheaply from uh, from eBay and from China that would sit in the, the kind of the customer premises side of things. You know, all of the telcos were pushing various different ways of, of, of means of connecting stuff up. And you know, as far as hosting was concerned, you know, clearly there's people like um, Amazon who've got the whole thing sewn up. Um, so, um, sorry, just somebody come unexpectedly coming through the door. Um, and so I, I was a little bit skeptical, but once I got to talk to him, what I realised is that there was huge amounts of, of friction at various different points um, in that whole. Um, potential platform. If you assemble all these things together, there was an opportunity to to knock out the friction and empower um, quite significant innovation from people. And so that whether that's at the at the equipment end or the connectivity end or the hosting end, if we can remove the friction at every different uh, point, we can start to empower people to do their own innovation. And I think probably the best analogy is kind of the um, almost the Lotus Notes days to my Lotus Notes days where when you started to put the tools of development into the hands of the users, they started to come with really interesting applications. They may have created a nightmare for the IT department, but they built stuff that was actually useful. And I think that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do, and particularly with a focus on, uh, on government, local government, you know, empowering cities, towns, regions to um, support the um, innovation from their citizens, from their users. I'm losing you there. I don't know if anybody else is. I, I lost a half a sentence there. I don't know whether we can do something about that. What, what, are, what are the thoughts? 
We seem to have lost audio there. Am I still there? No, you're there. There, there was I a little bit of uh, a little of, um, bit of packet loss. Packet loss. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, Go. we'll keep we'll, we'll keep going. I'm just so so. Yeah, I mean, I I think that I think that's right. That there's a there's a space there. I'm not quite sure what it is yet. And I think that's part of the fun of the Internet of Things. Is is this business that it's pretty clear that there is some value there. Um, it's pretty clear that some there there are some fantastically stupid products, and I have to say, I saw one this week. Uh, uh, this I don't know if any of you been following my Twitter feed this this week, but ye yesterday I think it was, somebody spotted that there is a a Spanish bed mattress company that is selling an internet connected mattress for detecting infidelity. <laughs> this this is actually its product. It's you know it's not an accidental side effect. This is what they're marketing it for, and um, and we were having a laugh that actually you know there were possibly practical uses for this technology, like having some mechanism for keeping the dog off the bed when you're at work. But you know, like its its core purpose was patently absurd, and there are just so many devices out there like that. So we sort of you know the the Gartner hype cycle will will kick in at some point, and all of this stuff will blow off and we'll be left with with the things that are useful but my problem is and I don't know if anybody else is like you know if you're feeling more confident about this my problem is is not always obvious which is which yeah for, for me it's, it's the classic product led versus market led innovation you know there, there's loads of stuff popping up because you can people are building things because they can and you know as the price a lot of this hardware falls I mean the comparison I always give is you know, I, I sold it up age, I don't know, 11, 12, a robot controller for a ZX Spectrum. This thing cost me a fortune. It was a pain to build and it barely worked. You know, I'm manually coding this thing out of the pages of a magazine. And it probably cost about 50 quid to put together. That was a lot of pocket money. Whereas now I can buy components that are way more capable, reliable, powerful, off eBay for a couple of quid. But the, the, the corollary to that is once people have got access to that stuff and it is available, people build all sorts of stupid stuff that there isn't really a demand for. And the conversation we have regularly in Cyberpublic is, is, is about applications. It's, it's about real applications. And I actually had, <laughs> had a very interesting conversation with an engineer from one of the, one of the very, very big um, platforms, Internet of Things platforms, who was deeply frustrated in that they're, they're, they, they have this very, very sophisticated platform out there, but no real you doing anything interesting. Whereas before we had a real platform, we had some fantastic conversations with people who had very, very serious needs, where actually you know, they understood the limitations of the Internet of Things, and even with those limitations, what you could do with sensors, with connectivity, could absolutely transform simple applications. Yeah, I mean, there's a glorious example which I think actually you may have may have come across because it's in it's one of the things that they're talking about doing in Manchester. Although I suspect they won't in the end, um, which is about um, digital signage. And you think, oh God, really? Do we really need digital signage that you know is updatable by the instant? You know, if you're outside the context of railway stations, is this of any possible use? And the answer is actually yes, because um, <laughs> Manchester is bless it, um, going through a major re revamp of the transport infrastructure and, um, and basically where you can park and where you can drive will change from day to day. So the idea of having signage that actually can be changed to accommodate the fact that you know this road is closed or that one is busy and will get people to a parking slot in time to get into the office on time actually will make the city work. So I think that sort of, that sort of stuff is actually fascinating that that you take something that seems like a an advertising product, effectively a thing that you know that puts a big picture of a man smoking a cigarette. Only not not these days. Um, uh, but actually now um, it does does the other thing. It says you know if you want to park and you want to get into the office in ten minutes, then you better go this way. And I think that sort of stuff, if we can realise it in a way that isn't just totally glitched and broken, I think it's really interesting. But how we get from these nice concepts to something that is actually is decent, really reliable and usable, I think is is a huge challenge. Um, and I don't think it's easy, actually. I think actually speaks to actually the very nature of the Internet of Things. 
you know, that what people do is confuse the Internet of Things with something much further along that spectrum of reliability and performance, which you might call the industrial internet. And, and so you know, we, we've been controlling stuff over, you know, by electronic means for, for absolutely decades. But the Internet of Things is never going to be a replacement for something where you want real-time control and critical control of something on the other end. But if you can accept, I mean, and this is today's technology, a level of intermittency, you know, a level of um, you know, occasional failure, um, but trade that off against the incredibly low cost, and it still adds value, then that is a today application for the Internet of Things. Uh, and it's, it is, you've got to take those things into account, I think, when you're starting to consider what real applications are right now. So I think what that means, though, then, is that you, you need to make sure that the failure mode is, is not worse than it not being there. Yes. There's too many negatives in that, but you, you know what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. That, that you know, at, at least the, the, the signage shouldn't be misleading. If it's there, it should be right, or it should be off, you know, um, or, or whatever the equivalent is. You know, it should fail in a way that, that is, is manageable. And I think that's the thing that we're really struggling with, that, that if you look at things like Nest and, and all of those guys, they fail... When they fail, they just basically brick the device, and and then you're like, if you're expecting it to work in any useful way, then that's a disaster, um, or it's a PR disaster at least. And I think that's the other thing, we, which is, I think is particularly interesting that you're getting into this space is that that I think the Internet of Things is gunning for a complete PR disaster, like the utter failure of the security and actually at a failure of an awful lot of it um, is is just going to get a bad rep with everybody pretty soon if it hasn't yeah, I think already. Yeah, I mean, I think this is some very serious commercial failures. I think it was Revolve recently, which was an IoT hub that people bought, and in turning off, they have basically, they haven't just turned it off, they've basically bricked it. And I think one, one commentator compared it to a tub of hummus now, which is what it really resembles, and it's about as useful as one. It's less useful than a tub of hummus right now. Um, because they've not just, you know, they've turned off the entire back end that supported it. You know, and one of the things we're, we're very keen on at Republic is there's so much good open stuff out there. You know, there, there is a lot of interesting development being, do, being done. But if we're going to build something, it has to be open. We, we built a business model that says, if you want to use your own equipment on this end, fine. If you want to use your own connectivity, fine. You know, whichever bit of the layer you want us to plug into and provide, that's fine. But there should be no, we should not be a point of failure for your solution. If you want to port your hosting somewhere else at some point, but keep a keep our connectivity, fine. Because you're absolutely right, it's going to kill innovation. People start building stuff on these closed platforms, and then one day somebody decides it's not worth it, that the experiment didn't work, and they turn it off, and it goes pop. It, 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 it demotivates people apart from anything else. And I think that we will only see the real you know, benefit of this, just like we only saw the real benefit of the web once the, hand of, the tools of publishing were put in more people's hands. We'll only see the real benefit of the Internet of Things if we put the tools of production into more people's hands. That's almost socialist talk, there, Tom. Well, I, I am occasionally accused of being almost socialist. <laughs> <laughs> the, the workers control them into production or something. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think interestingly that I, I was looking at, at Revolve and 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 how what a what a monstrous mess um, Google and Nest have made of that, and and to be honest, of Nest itself. Um, but but the funny contrast that when I was doing the research on that, the funny contrast was was with PARS, which is an equivalent story where Facebook bought this team of people who had a, a, a back end, actually, it didn't actually have any physical devices, but um, and they um, they shut that down because it was another aqua hire. But they did it right because they open sourced the, the server. They gave people warning and they open sourced the server so that it was, you know, that's kind of what you're saying, is that it, if it's open and there is a get out clause, then at least people can and particularly if you give them a bit of warning, it's a pain. They didn't want to have to do the extra development and run the servers and whatever, but at least it's possible. If there is a real business there, then they'll do it. And if there isn't, they'll just use it as an excuse for shutting it down anyway. So, you know, I think that's I think that's a that's a critical component. But how do you how do you match that against the 
kind of the investors desire to own the IPR and the people who are lending you money to do these things aren't going to do that if you don't own the IPR. How, does it, how do you square that? So I think there's two pieces to this I and mean, it's really about having a split business model. You know, one of which is, I, I, I remember in my days of doing a lot of marketing for telcos, writing lots about dumb pipes and particularly doing work for people like uh, Tel Labs and Sonus Networks about writing all these pieces for telcos about how they didn't have to be a dumb type and how they could do all sorts of things. And then a few years later, um, you know, Talk Talk in the UK come along and make a really great business out of being basically a dumb pipe, just doing it better and more efficiently than everybody else. They sell, you know, made a lot of money selling a voice, which everybody else thought was a good model. And, and you know, part of what we're doing with Republic of Things is just being a really good dumb pipe. You know, do it very, very efficiently, and, it, and it's a cash generative business. There's an, there's an attractive business model to be had there if you do certain things well for people and to get the friction out of doing what you want to do. But the flip side to that is there are some bits of the IoT model which haven't been solved. You know, there are problematic pieces that are yet to be addressed, particularly around security. And so if you can build this simple, relatively dumb but useful for its customers, cash generative model, then you can reinvest some of that cash flow back into innovation and fixing the bits that nobody else has yet. And that's where you start to build intellectual property, I think, that has that, that, that scale value, that multiple value that perhaps might interest the likes of the VCs, albeit we're not you know, looking, seeking VC investments at the moment. Um, and, and I think, you know, as I say, particularly around the security model, I think when you've got a hugely distributed network of very low power devices that have massive constraints on you know, battery power, on processing power, you know, how you actually secure the communications between those and some sort of hub, whether it's directly connected or via some sort of intermediary, that's a really interesting challenge. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously I totally agree with, with you on that. Just tracking back to the telco thing, I had a funny experience earlier this week where when my wife announced that she was switching um, switching mobile phone companies, and um, and this was news to me, I wasn't consulted, which is just fine. But you know, and I was so I was I was a little taken aback to to find that she said, "Well, so I found this really cool cool lot. They're called Gift Gaff, and if you sign up with them, you can I'll get you'll get a free tennis worth of minutes, and so will I." And I'm thinking, God, their marketing's good. It's like, you know, the fact that they managed to do this, like, I mean, I was sitting there as she was talking with a, actually a gift gaff sim sitting next to me thinking, <laughs> right, I, I totally failed to earn my 10 quid here. Um, but, but then, the, I mean, the really the, the astonishing thing for those of, those of you listening who don't know about gift gaff, gift gaff is a, is a model, it's a lean model of an MVNO. So it's a mobile phone company run on, the, on, on a big public network but that's like lean and you know they basically don't do support because they have a forum for that they don't have any shops because that's what the internet's for it's like real real stripped down so you read all this stuff and and it's and it's very kind of viral the marketing is all viral marketing and this kind of stuff so you read all this and you think god this must be a really innovative company behind this and when you dig into it what you find is that it's a wholly owned subsidiary of O2 Telefonica and and that they are doing this this um, you know just from I don't know I, I don't know how they've kind of they've carved off this innovative way of doing stuff outside the behemoth but anyway I so I think it's interesting that that that, that sort of telco model in the MVNO space if played right can be different but not radically different from the thing it's spun out from. So I mean presumably that's where Republic of Things is interested in going is 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 the kind of you know getting the best out of the existing network but maybe not treating it in the normal way or I don't I mean I don't know if you yeah, can talk about any of that. So I mean take connectivity is a good example, right? You you can go and get a data SIM card um, but it's relatively expensive. It's quite often bundled with way more um, data than you're actually going to need for a simple IoT type project and it's very difficult to get an endpoint to actually send that data to unless you know what you're doing when you're configuring AWS or something like that. I mean, yeah, what we can do is bundle, we, we have our MBNO license, what we can do is bundle a SIM card with a sensible amount of monthly data with, a, with, you know, with an endpoint to point that data at 
and all of a sudden we've knocked out two of the pain points of actually getting your product up and running. We're also actually looking to um, roll out a LoRaWAN um, antenna um, across a variety of metro areas, which is a you know, very low cost way of directly connecting um, IoT projects you know, back to the network. Um, and that's yeah, you know, it, it's it's aimed at cities who want to empower you know, citizens and perhaps even public sector employees to start to do that their own innovation. And and part of it is knocking out that connectivity problem and actually the cost challenge. We have an MUI, a mustache unmaskable interrupt from Chris Matthew. Chris, you had a couple of questions. Let's hear them. Don't forget on your mind. Yeah, there we go. So hey Tom. Uh, a couple of questions around. Uh, I've got a lot of questions, but um, mostly around uh, scale at the moment. Um, you know, uh, I'm one of the founders of Octoblue, and one of the things we keep thinking about is, you know, once you get to the point where you've got, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of these uh, sensors, and you need to modify something, what what do you, what are you guys thinking as terms of? I mean, are, are these all connected via APIs? Can you push code like with Resin? Can you uh, remote download? Can you? How do you tweak like a hundred thousand devices uh, uh, that you need on the fly? <laughs> we're we're, we're kind of t think having thoughts around that right now too. It's a really interesting point, and actually, it's not one of the problems we're solving for people at the moment. The reality is, is that our customers are maybe you know unlikely to be running more than hundred certainly of sensors themselves. They're probably going to be running ten on this project, maybe fifty on another. It may you know, scale up to much bigger operations, but but our direct customers tend not to be the operations who may be running mass scale operations where they're trying to maintain the software on thousands of different devices. We're more likely to be supporting uh, you know, smaller innovators through a, a geographically centered community. And so we might, we will probably add components to our software stack that give them some sort of MDM type capability if they're using our um, code templates in order to run there. We have a, we have this very, very, very simple, what my friend calls uh, my first PCB level of, um, of uh, hardware template at the end. We'll have, a, we'll have a reference code piece for that, which will have maybe have some sort of uh, SCOTA type um, implementation in it. Um, but most people, I think, will be running, will be rolling their own, and will be providing connectivity, hosting, processing. Um, but it, you're right; it's a, it's a really interesting challenge. And it's you know, you look at the um, the acquisition of people like Jasper Wireless. You look at um, companies like Red Bend, based in Israel. You know, they they're the ones tackling that problem on the mass scale. Whereas for us, we're generally thinking about communities of tens or hundreds of devices. Are you um? Are you doing one way? Are you one way? Are you are you bidirectional? Wait a second, because Tom's uh, auto mute software just died. So you have you can have to mute Tom. I think you did. Go ahead, uh, Chris. Yeah, I was I was curious. Are you doing uh, one way uh, uh, messaging, like from sensor to big data? Or are you doing bidirectional? And if so, what what types of protocols are you guys using today? Um, so it's uh, based on MQTT um, uh, TLS between the, effectively the gateway and the um, uh, and a broker on the uh, hosting side. It's two way, um, but again, it's very application dependent. So most of the applications that we're talking to people about now are primarily sensing um, rather than control. For all the reasons I was, I don't know if you're around, I was talking to Tim about earlier about the the level of of, of um, reliability you can you, know, you can expect right now from the internet from low cost hardware. What people really want is intermittent sensing of certain parameters, whether that's vibration, temperature, um, air quality is particularly hot right now in the UK. Um, they want you know, simple ways or geography, you know, location of something. They want simple ways to to measure stuff intermittently rather than pass a great deal of control back in the other direction. And I think as we start to see uh, you know, greater levels of robustness and um, and actually more creativity as well. People start to think more about what they might want to control in those situations where it doesn't have to be real time, where it doesn't matter if that switch goes on five minutes before or five minutes after. I think once you start to see more of the two-way, but right now, even though it's capable of doing two-way, it's primarily sensing data coming up. 
Very good. Are you guys uh, uh, mostly relying on IMT security yeah. as your yeah. model now, or do you have anything on top of that? So we're working on a, a number of um, options on that moment. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically it's basic MQTT with um, you know effectively um, encrypted from gateway up to hosting. We're not doing anything particularly sexy beyond that. But we know that it's one of the areas that we want to look at. So we're looking at innovation around the, if you like the, um, if if you're doing a, a hub and spoke model at the at the customer site, if you like, we're looking at the security between the the nodes and the gateway. Um, and if we're doing direct communication, particularly, we're looking at the security of the of the two way communication between the two. We have some very interesting people on board, um, so uh, particularly um, the, the sorts of people who tend to crop up in three-letter acronyms, government Do you guys do uh, like uh, Hive MQ or just some pure MQTT um, uh, providers uh, as competitors, or do you guys have more than just uh, MQTT uh, uh, messaging in your stack? Um, so for us, I mean, we're kind of open. Um, we don't really see them as competitors. Our, our whole play is acknowledgement of that no one thing we do could not be done by someone else. But the advantage of choosing us is that we're a shortcut to innovation. That, that we're the lowest possible friction way of getting stuff done and up and running quickly. So are we going to be the absolute cheapest way or absolute best way to do every part of the stack on day one? Almost certainly not. On day one. On that end, you know, probably also be best to breed in different bits. But what we're really trying to do is take the friction out of innovation to say, look, all you have to do is you know spend a very small amount of money, plug sensor A into port B, and select this recipe on a, on your web interface, and bang, you're graphing the data out of that, and you can start to track it. Um, the planet have a variety of recipes for a variety of different applications, both hardware and software, and provide people with both the um, documented support, but also commun curated community support around different topic areas to help them get to help them get from naught to sixty as fast as possible. Uh, the, uh, one, the, one last one question one uh, regarding uh, developers. developers. What do you offer do you to developers? get developers up to speed uh, on, on your platform or build custom solutions uh, outside of your, um, your, your recipes? <laughs> right now, uh, not a huge amount. I mean, we're still at a fairly embryonic stage where most of the customers who are contacting us are after connectivity and not a huge amount more. Um, we have the stack. Um, based on OpenStack based, um, we're pretty flexible in terms of what people run on it. They can take virtual instances and go from there. Um, with the advantage of having high bandwidth connectivity, access to a number of IPv6 endpoints to point data at. Um, so you know, right now, all we'd offer them is is the fact that we're a small team. They'll be talking individually to us, and we can offer them a lot of flexibility. In the future, I think it's very much about not locking people in. You know, why will choose people choose to come to us and stay with us? For a start, I mean, the, because we're doing a lot of public sector work, we've had to be very cautious about the decisions we make in terms of uh, where things are hosted and how they're connected. Um, so from a security perspective, we're very strong. Um, but you know, the, uh, we want people to come to us because perhaps, in part, they know they don't always have to be with us. A couple of questions here. Uh, Chris. Um Everything okay there? You good? Can anybody hear me even? I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> You're loud All right. and clear. Maybe Chris. Uh, so uh, before we turn it over to James, Jay had a question. I think it's, um, if I can find it, because um, James has got some questions. Fred has some questions. But before that, there was one question from... Jay, which I'm trying to find, and I think, oh, he says, it, Jay Carpenter says, Tom, uh, are you looking at blockchain or Ethereum or IPFS? Uh, not, none of those explicitly now. Um, as often with founders, our founder, Andrew, has um, big ideas um, around machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, and even applications for the visualization of some of this data in virtual reality. 
um, but our chairman is doing a very good job of, of uh, keeping him on the straight and narrow and focused on what we have to do today rather than what we might do tomorrow. So those areas are uh, fascinating and ripe with potential. In fact, I've just been having an interesting ch Twitter chat with uh, John Bradford from Textiles, uh, who was uh, uh, chastising me for being overly pessimistic about blockchain. And I had to point out to him, I'm not pessimistic at all. It's just the scale of the opportunity there is so enormous, both in terms of what it could do commercially, but also perhaps in terms of interesting social change, that I have to force myself to be very, very cautious about the reality. Okay, and I'm going to let James, uh, James, would you deal with Fred's question as well, and then you, you have several of your own, of course. Yeah, sure, and uh, I'm wearing my uh, my moustache today in honor of Chris, because it's so rare that we, we get to see him that I thought I'd put this on. So, uh, a question from Fred, who's in a bakery in Florida at the moment, such as the power of the internet. He would like to know whether your solution is based on one controller, or whether you are you uh, use uh, more of a super node approach. And then he expands, if I had a 10,000 devices, they all check in with one controller point, question mark, Tom. So uh, super noddy it is at the moment, which is, um, sorry for the Americans, the reference is super simple. Um, we can do direct connection via Oroland devices. We can do effectively a hub and spoke model. Um, to a gateway, and now from there we're actually using um, a 2.4 gigahertz protocol that isn't um, Wi-Fi. So at the moment, on a start topology, up to about 255 devices, we do have a up and running but rudimentary mesh network as well, where they expand that out. Um, so depending on what the application would be, would change which one of those you might go, you know, down the route of. We're completely agnostic. We don't mind. Um, and yeah, you know, one, one central controller and 10,000 devices, you might want to spread things out a little bit. And you certainly want to be looking, as, uh, as Tim and I were talking about earlier, what your failover model looks like. Crikey, that's a pretty comprehensive answer. That's good. Um, now can I get on to my questions? Randy. Everybody says that you all questions should go through you, James, because they so, love you. Yeah, indeed. So, Tom, um, though, uh, you haven't been on before. I, I want to know, Tom, where have you been for the last, um, I don't know, four or five years? Where have you been hiding? Why have I not come, come across you? Um, but don't answer that. What you can answer is, what can you show us? Uh, uh, some real live applications. Um, can you demonstrate anything to us, dangerous uh, or not? Not a lot right now. So the sorts of things we've been testing with are uh, just simple air quality sensors. So using uh, you know larger numbers of low quality air sensors to see if we can start to extrapolate things from the data. So air quality sensing is incredibly expensive. Uh, one of the things we're interested in is if if we can start to connect sensors up for about three pounds a piece, and um, that may not be the retail price, but if you know, we can start to assemble connected sensors. And effectively connect anything to the internet for three pounds. Um, can we overcome the limitations of very, very expensive sensors with a large number of sensors and start to extrapolate from that data? And um, the sorts of conversations we've been having and the applications we've been prototyping in, I, I'm trying to think how much I can say about this one. But yeah, really, just tell us everything. Come on, well, you're amongst friends here. A really interesting real world application was around um, how to put this. Without, I'm, I'm pretty sure there is an NDA that's going to control how much I can say. Should we say industrial monitoring? So, you know, I was saying earlier about the difference between the Internet of Things and the industrial Internet. Most industrial monitoring, you absolutely positively want to know exactly when something has happened and be happening and be able to stop it if it's going wrong. But there are certain pieces of the, of the factory where when something starts to fail, you've probably got a two, four, maybe even six week window before it starts to fail, not two, four, six seconds. And so monitoring things like that with your classic industrial internet approach is incredibly expensive. You might be spending hundreds of pounds, possibly even thousands, for very rudimentary sensing, um, which will be connected back into the rest of the plant, and then you have to buy extra hardware for the monitoring and the communications. And it's just daft, right? It's just a silly amount of money. It's the point where it's so expensive to do they end up using manual applications instead, people walking around checking whether something is wobbling or not. And so we had a conversation with a, with a company and said, well, do you know what? We can connect that thing up for 
you know, to you, thirty pounds rather than three or four hundred, which is what they might currently be paying for something to monitor it. And, and instead of you know somebody walking around checking them, they can sit down, have a cup of tea, and wait for an alert on their phone to tell them it needs to be changed at some point in the next fortnight. Uh, and we built some, uh, one of our first trials actually building a series of monitors for that sort of application, uh, went into two different scenarios and proved actually A, that the, uh, the network we were using functioned quite ably inside a, inside a fairly difficult, noisy environment, which was to a, a level of a surprise, frankly, um, and, and B, that you can start to monitor this stuff and deliver some value um, without spending those enormous sums of money. So, you, Tom, you're not going to show us how poor the uh, the air quality is in Manchester, up in the uh, around the, uh, the smoke-filled mills up in north. The, the the air quality is not the problem here; it's the moisture. The moisture. Well, how <laughs> moist is it? it it's currently it's pouring Manchester. in the sky. I can tell you that much. <laughs> well, it's pouring here in London as well. I can't even see the Olympic Stadium; it's that wet. So that's. That's scary. So, um, tell me a bit more about your LoRaWAN and your MVNO type activities. What are you doing with, in terms of um, linking sensors and core infrastructure? The, the, the LoRaWAN infrastructure is fairly embryonic, fairly embryonic. In fact, I can't say who, but we've just signed a license. We've just signed an agreement today to deploy another two um, antenna uh, in a tower in the UK. And the, and the idea is really that we, we partner with a, a local authority. Um, many of whom are interested in and have heard about these various kind of smart city initiatives around the world, but don't have the budget to go to a, uh, a Telefonica or a BT or an IBM or a Cisco and build out these enormous, um, uh, I think, you know, uh, Santander style networks. Have you ever seen the, the smart city projects in Santander? What they want to do is empower innovation in their cities. And we, my initial thoughts were, and our initial thoughts were, that an MVNO was the, the best way to do that. And certainly it's important because it gives us nationwide connectivity. But actually, the, uh, the, the LoRaWAN standard has started to pick up quite a lot of traction here relatively recently as a, as a low cost, effective way to do metro area connections. Uh, and it, what you find around um, British cities particularly is there's quite a few uh, not unused but perhaps underused fiber loops with a number of points of presence around them. We have them in Manchester, we know there's one in Blackpool, Blackburn, uh, you know, various places, various cities in Scotland. And it's a question of you know, what, you put on, what you put on the top of one of those points of presence. And if you can pop an antenna on at a relatively low cost, you can suddenly start to enable um, connectivity within a sensible radius of that. So, I mean, right now it's a question to build it and they will come. Um, and, you know, the, the, the first step is to start to set up the connectivity. The second step is starting to build a community, a kind of support community to help people, entrepreneurial thinkers either in the local authority, in education, in universities, um, in the local area to start to build applications on top of that. And that's really the next step for us is, is start with the connectivity and then start to empower communities with training, support, online video guides, the recipes I talked about. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, think, I think Chris, Chris you're... Oh, crikey. Crikey. Yeah, Tom, yeah, that's, Tom that's, that's... the echo's coming back via your client. Right, give me a second. Uh, and, and we've seen this... Be... things doesn't regulate the echo properly. Yeah, we, we've seen this before with Google Hangouts. What happens if that one person just talks and talks and talks, the echo cancellation gets a bit lazy and goes to sleep. Oh, but he has a special device that I, we saw. I was very impressed with in the beginning, but apparently there really? was a little problem with it. Yeah, I, he has... Uh, I missed that, bitch. Tom, don't you have some kind of an automatic thing that lights up, has red and blue LEDs and everything? Show that to us. You're muted now, though. You're muted, Tom. You have to unmute on the Hangout. No, he's... Wait, I can't unmute. It looks like the Starship Enterprise. So. Go ahead. Brilliant. Yeah, it's an interesting device. Show that again, Tom, would you please? Now you're muted in the device. You're not muted in the Hangout. Uh-oh. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> what? No audio. What the hell? Yeah, you know audio. Noise council has taken a different view. Totally James, I do like the mustache. Yeah, I like yours too, but and yours better. So have we got 
we got Tom. Oh, no. Yeah, now we've got Tom's audio off after all this. Try that. I think it's your 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 Bluetooth headset thing is muted. Um, yeah. Uh, have that send them back. Please. Nope. I don't know where that's. That's not even. So in, in, just to 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 fill in, uh, I should tell you that we can't. We're, although Tom does, we're not actually allowed to, particularly in the um, industrial world, complain about the fact that uh, it's raining in Manchester because, in fact, Manchester was became an industrial city precisely because of the rain. The water is is the foundation of the um, of the wool industry and up here, and, and it's why Manchester exists at all. So, if you complain about the rain, then you yeah you're 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 leading in the wrong direction as far as the industrial heritage is concerned, at least. Um, Isn't there something about steel good. blades though? Hmm? Razor blades or something? No, that's not Manchester. What? No, that's Sheffield. No, Sheffield. Oh, nearby, Sheffield. nearby but deadly rival. You yeah, shouldn't mix Sheffield. the two. Sorry. We need to get Tom's audio back. He's talking and we don't hear you, Tom. Switch your mic back to the... Oh, my God. Yeah, switch switch your the built-in one and see what happens. Where, yeah, wherever you were because we're not... Well, now you're muted on Hangouts. Is yeah, it, sign language. Yeah. No, unmute the Hangout, first of all, Tom. Yeah, Hangout is muted, Tom. Because in a week, and no one else can do that for you. Grab them. Okay. Yeah, no, that's good. No, say something. No? No, so switch your microphone back to where it was originally, and we'll continue. Meanwhile, I'm going to ask people if you have any final questions, because we're getting up to the last uh, 13 minutes or so, approximately. Uh, if... Well, I'd like to know whether Tom's actually uh, had any conversation or come across the Matthew and... The uh, the wonderful team of desperados from Matrix Matrix dot yeah. org because yeah, well, he's I his... think I've mentioned Matrix to them. I don't know if they've met. It's a bit far north for Matthew. Okay, um, let me let me just insert this while Matt well while, uh, while Tom is uh, looking at his microphone because we forgot to do this and I meant to do it in the in, in the intro and forgot. And of course we will all be well. Chris won't be there. Unfortunately, there will be very few mustaches at Camelio World in Berlin. You should come, Chris. It would be great. But uh, I don't think he's going to make it. But that's Berlin, May 18th to 20th. Many of us will be there. And uh, the, the creme de la creme of European hoi polloi <laughs> will be there, including James. Ooh. Including and, James. And, the, and Tim. Or, or we including we James. Mira and I suppose so I, uh, I suppose uh, okay? Zoa although I I'm more interested in Mira being showing up but anyway Zoa uh, will be there too you're yeah, so, so this is going to be a great event we love this Tom we're still not hearing you I'm just kind of so, in so my, my advice Tom is to quit and rejoin we'll, we'll still be here yeah, yeah. we'll wait for you okay and he's alright so anyway you've got to come and uh, meet all of us at come in your world. Meantime, we're waiting for any questions anybody have. Did we talk? Yeah, and uh, Jay, Jay asked about Jay the business talk. model, which is a good question too. Anyway, go ahead, James. I'll let you uh, take over. Yeah, well, I was going to say, Jay wants to ask the archetypal question, the one that pops up every time we get uh, get a conception. Oh, yeah, Tom, we're back. And I'm we're yes, yeah, we've, got, we've got some echo back, so yes. Fine. But that's yeah. fine because he's going to talk. So Jay Carpenter has asked Tom about the business model. Want to comment on that? Mm. Yeah. So um, the the business model is really really simple. In the early days, is we provide we charge people a monthly fee for um, hosting, processing, connectivity. Um, we then uh, have a, a kind of we bolt on top of that for the local communities or the topic communities we're supporting. Um, charge whoever the kind of the sponsor of that community is usually a local authority a fee to effectively uh, curate and support that community. Okay. And then well, on top of that, so what would uh, a customer like a local authority get for their money? What would they actually see? So uh, it starts with these effectively these recipes. So Im imagine it's you'll you'll start with. Um, uh, connectivity. So you can get online. You can then access a portal which says, "Here's how you build a project: a step-by-step -step guide to building a project connecting to this." They'll get support, so they'll get live um, feedback. They'll get effectively um, 
promotion and sharing of local projects back to the community, so the connection of uh, local entrepreneurs with each other. And actually, we've, you know, one of the things we've found is that despite there being a huge number of interesting innovators out there, quite often people don't even know how to get started on slightly larger projects. So we've, okay. we've been... Can, can you give us some... Sorry, sorry, leaping in. Can you give us an example of one that's been reflected back to the local community that we can have a look at? Uh, no, not for us, because we're not at that stage yet. So most of our, our commissions to date have been... So we've been pulled in by corporations to fix problems like the industrial monitoring I talked about. We've been pulled in by uh, local authorities um, to start to provide this connectivity and support other projects. But we're not yet curating any local communities. That, that's the next step. As I say, we literally signed a deal today to put another two antenna in somewhere. But the first antenna will be live on that. Okay, well, can you give us some examples of the sort of thing that you would expect to become open to the public? Sure. So, uh, so an interesting example, one of the first ones that's probably going to go up is a city in the UK. Um, I, I mentioned air quality monitoring. Uh, very concerned about air quality, particularly in um, uh, areas used by young people. And th there were some big stats last year around the number of deaths that air quality is contributing to, and they want to start to monitor this, both for health purposes, but also, I think, marketing purposes. The city wants to market itself as a, as a better quality place to live, shall we say, um, an, a, a not uncommutable distance from London. Um, and so the, one of the, an early project will be putting a series of air quality sensors across parks in this area. Um, now that we will provide, we, in this case, we'll provide the connectivity, we'll provide the hosting, the processing, but actually we're being commissioned to build the, um, the hardware and provide the software as well. So, you know, the early days where people aren't confident doing their own prototyping, we might get pulled in to do that almost systems integrator role as well. And that would be partly us and partly outsource capability. Okay, so the, uh, the local community get a warm, fuzzy feeling that they're um, their air quality is not quite as smoggy as it was yesterday, or something like that. Yeah. Well, I, I give you, I give you a much kind of grittier example. You know, one of the interesting conversations we'd have was being a, a partnership between the local authority, a housing association, and the local NHS primary care trust, and actually also the uh, building services provider who supports the um, the uh, housing trust. Um, so if, if you don't, if those who don't know, the housing trust is the people who are, used to be social, publicly owned housing in the UK. And what they want to do is is see if there is a uh, initially a correlation and ultimately a causal relationship between the quality of housing and time and money spent um, by the local um, primary care trust, the the health services provider. And so we're looking at monitoring things like damp, CO2 levels. Um, air quality inside the building um, across a range of social housing and correlating that back to the medical records of the individuals who live in those buildings. And, and the, ultimately to make the case for investment to come back from the health services provider back into the housing provider because in the long term there are savings to be made by reducing those people's interaction with the health services and improving their quality of life. There's an interesting political context to that, particularly here here in, in the north, which is that we're the local government's becoming responsible for more and more of those sorts of services. And so they have the, the, the opportunity to to do that kind of what you might think of as cross fertilization or cross optimization across quite a, a broad stre uh, stretch of um, of services. And it, it you know I think gathering data is, is laudable because it, it hopefully makes for better decisions. Um, the only, my only personal worry here is that in some cases these projects may be being done as a way of delaying having to do the thing that obviously needs doing, like sorting out the damp. Um, but that, that, you know, that's the price of progress, I suspect, that, you know, there isn't the yeah. money to do, there isn't the money to do it wholesale, so you actually have to collect the data in order to target the worst, you know, the worst instances where you will get, therefore, the best value for money in, in what limited investment you can put in. So, I mean, it is immensely, intensely political, particularly, you know, here in that, that corridor that goes from Liverpool to Hull. That, that whole sway is turning into a kind of fascinating um, political Damn experiment. Patch. Sorry? Moist patch. Well, yes. <laughs> well, one, well yeah, one good thing about it is uh, just think 
how many refugees you're going to get from the Sahara and places with no water, because they're, they're going to be going up to the, uh, the frozen north like a shot, aren't they? All this lovely you know, this, water. This, uh, this tracks, it brings to mind an experiment that's uh, beginning in Ontario, or has just begun, in uh, replacing um, the provincially provided welfare with, uh, uh, in two small towns, uh, guaranteed basic income. Uh, the upshot of which being they're anticipating the return based on savings in publicly sponsored healthcare costs for those communities. Similar sort of phenomena. Yeah, I think I think there's a city in Finland currently going through the same experiment. Yeah, I have yeah. big problems with uh, with concepts like that because if everybody has a guaranteed income, what's the incentive to work? Well, first of all, the income is tiny, and second of all. Um, you know, every, and everybody I know, including everyone on this panel, would be working regardless of the income. Would you not? Yeah, but, but I would want to be on a minim, ga, minimum the, um, income. The experiments that have been done, which tra track back over 40 years, uh, indicate that there are a significant number of people that just want to work, that people want to be productive, Most that it isn't, quite, it isn't quite the way the naysayers would have it. On the other hand, you have uh, social phenomena, or, you know, workplace automation going on, that jobs are going to become increasingly scarce as we go forward. So these two curves need to meet a little bit and, uh, and find uh, ways to sustain people because you need economic units. People are economic units. You need active economic units, or you have nobody to buy your services and products. Exactly. exactly. Uh, I'm intrigued by the uh, Martin Ford, uh, you know, type arguments about this, and uh, I had a chance to meet um, the guys from the Oxford Martin Institute who wrote that paper uh, about uh, 18 months ago, which suggested about 35% of jobs um, automated by 20. 35, I think, um, Michael Osborne and Carl Benedict Frey, and it's, you know, the, the more you listen to these guys, the more compelling it is. So that uh, changes the conversation about guaranteed basic income. Yeah. There really uh, are just it, so many... Go ahead, Michael, sorry. No, it just, it, it's interesting that the, the Internet of Things is one of the technological drivers of, of all of this, and so it definitely relates. And the, the thing that I think is going to be really interesting and hard for people to to come to grips with is crossing the technological with some, which is sort of an engineering discipline, right, with some kind of social architecture uh, changes. Yeah. I don't know if many of you eat at places like McDonald's. I certainly almost never do. Uh, but one of the things I saw even here in Europe, and I don't know if it's the same in the UK, you can walk into a McDonald's restaurant and you have a kiosk where you can order and pay on a credit card. On your, on your debit card. I'm sure they have it in the States, obviously. And in that case, obviously a robot could get a lot, of, a lot of echo here from something. Uh, obviously, the delivery of the food could instantly be robotic. So you've eliminated all the jobs except the people who are actually frying this stuff or whatever. So, I mean, it, it's patently obvious that many, many jobs will just disappear. You just won't need the people anymore. Is uh, basic in income a remedy for that? I don't know, but certainly training them, uh, training them to learn to code is not, as far as I'm concerned. I, it's probably more realistic to give people money than to train everybody in the world to code, don't you think? Anybody want to kind of contradict me there? Well, I, I was going to mention in San Francisco there is a, a, a fast food burger place that's actually automated uh, the flipping of the burgers, and they're claiming that quality's actually gone up. Uh, time to customers gone down. Um, you know they're 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 actually producing better quality and more better quality burgers by completely automating with a kiosk in front, like you're talking about. So yeah, time to heart attack is reduced as well. It's really efficient. Time <laughs> to heart attack. I would say the CEO uh, the C the CEO of BMW was given a private presentation, uh, giving he was speaking to a private group uh, two months ago, I think it was. And uh, he was asked, you know, they were asking, uh, the group was asking about the impact of automation on the labor force in, in their factories in Germany. And, and he was very blunt in his reply. He said, we could completely automate everything, but the middle market, you know, our workforce would burn for it. And so there's no political will to do it at the moment. But the technology exists to do it.
Yeah, except the, the reverse is true in, in Mercedes. Mercedes have now found that because of the multiplicity of variants of their product, um, they now find that it's harder to automate it than it, than it is to have a well-trained workforce to, to produce the things. Now, I mean, there's obviously a trade-off, but they've actually backed down from pushing even further with automation for the moment because of this... this um, you know this matrix effect of all of the different variants that you can buy for your, you know, your Mercedes. So I think I think it's not totally given that that this will happen in all sp spheres. But I I mean I recognise the issue and I, it it came up rather viscerally for me about mm, just over a year ago when my my smallest daughter announced that she was going to go off and do um, a degree in 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 drama and music. And I thought, oh God, where's the career oh, in that? Like, like my daughter, you mean? Right. Well, well, wait a minute. So I, I thought, oh God, where's like the me. career in that? And then about 15 or 30 seconds later, I thought, you know what? By the time she really wants a job, that may be the only career that's left. Um, you know, the ability to tell a story and get up in front of an audience and amuse people may actually be the only thing that ever anyone gets paid for. Yeah, by it's that. the only thing that matters anyway. You know, there there is a robot. Uh, they call him Baxter. Um, that's a manufacturing robot that that oversees what people are are uh, building, and it's kind of spotting quality control issues. And uh, I think he's actually learning how to how to do it better. But uh, that there that's a that's a really interesting one that Intel continues to bring to shows. Hey, Chris, you need to be careful because somebody just wrote something proprietary on the blackboard behind the whiteboard behind you. <laughs> That's okay. It's all open source. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. I say to, to to Tim's point, you know, I so I, you know, I am I'm an I'm a, a, an investor and uh, you know shareholder in, in Republic of Things, but my my day job I actually run a, a futurism practice, and uh, a couple of years back I did a project with uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants looking at what. Uh, uh, what future? What we wanted from future employees? What we wanted from future graduates and school leavers? And I think it's actually what we came up with is actually a pretty good recipe for what's going to be um, defensible as human skills in the next 20 years. And we, we we talk about the three C's rather than the three R's, which is the ability to curate, create, and communicate. To, to discover and qualify information to synthesize something new from that information and to sell it to your colleagues and customers, whether that's a, a piece of interpretive dance or a, a piece of uh, writing or, or a completely new product. I'm 100% behind you on that, Tom. Uh, as far as the communicate part goes, uh, many of you will have noticed that a lot of people are not able to communicate to large segments. So you have, say, somebody who's into the rap culture. They can communicate with the people who are into that culture. And I'm not saying that's not sizable. Uh, other people can do TED Talks, and they they talk to people who would be interested in that, but then those people are not the rap, you know. So we've got these huge, huge communities, and you need to probably to succeed. Uh, well, one of the things of success, you mentioned three R's, the three C's. One of those would be talking to the maximum number of different audiences, wouldn't you think? Uh, but, and we will do a very good job of communicating to white middle class men. <laughs> right. Well, you know, speaking of communications, uh, did you guys see on Hack on uh, Hacker News, there was like everyone was releasing uh, AI chatbots this week. You know, from yeah. Facebook to Slack to Microsoft to, uh, 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 what's that, Telegram and, and others. So. You know, it's interesting that, that the more data, you know, these IoT platforms bring in, uh, the more likely machine learning and AI, or the more interesting uh, machine learning and AI solutions get. So I, I just thought that was interesting. It was just uh, everyone uh, released an AI chatbot this week. I, I, had a, I had a really serious case of deja vu then. I mean, like, it's, it's basically, like, what is it, 16 years since General Magic folded up? You know that the whole age in nineteen was it nineteen ninety or nine or two thousand and two or something. There was like this whole whole industry that was going to be agents that would do your bidding and 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 would would work on your behalf and like all of that stuff was fantastically irritating and impossible to use. And and they all and, went and broke. very very virtual. Uh, and, and on the subject of virtual. Uh, bots and things like that. I, I, I had a look at the specifications of some of these bits and pieces, and there's 
there's a lot of hype and not a lot, lot of real application there yet. So I, I noticed on Alan uh, Quayle's uh, latest uh, blog post about uh, the Minitech hack in, in London that uh, one of the winners did some kind of an AI bot uh, anti-bullying. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, I saw that. It, it, it was using uh, one of the, uh, well, I think it was the, the, the Microsoft sentiment. Um, Something uh, with Cisco oh, and maybe Tropos. Yeah, huh? yeah, absolutely. So what it was doing was doing a, a, well, a speech to text and then fire the text off into, uh, it was either Microsoft or IBM or somebody like that, who then analyzed the, the words to get the sentiment out. Um, and, and, and then if the words were nasty, then it would do something about it. Well, I have to say, I saw two demos like that. There was that one, and there was the one that the, the IBM guy gave of Watson um, analyzing text. And it was, frankly, terrible. Like, honestly, I was, I was embarrassed for the guy. It was just, you know, he said something about how angry he was, and it then joy spiked on this graph behind him. It's like, <laughs> it was, it was, uh, I mean, he said that it, there was a latency between that and, you know, it was the earlier joy you were seeing and whatever. Well, okay, maybe, but like, you know, it was a, it, it, it was a worryingly poor thing, and the and the it's bullying like guys your, yeah, like one of your demos from about ten years ago. <laughs> well, 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 and the bullying guys were almost more interesting because they had this thing which, which um, would give an analysis of of the sentiment of what you said, and he typed something like, you know, I hate you, I'm going to kill you, and that only scored sixty three percent on on dislike. And you're thinking, how you know? What else could you say to get it up to seventy-five percent? Like, how much more unpleasant do you have to be to, to hit eighty? It's like I was, I almost thought there was a game in that. It's like well, this is this well, despicable you know. game that you could create for how do you push Watson into the eighty-five percent dislike territory? Yeah, well, you know that as soon as you launch something like that, then the game will be to get the maximum score. The well, that's what they did to the Taylor Swift, uh, um, not uh, what was it, the Microsoft thing, uh, the Microsoft bot that yeah, they let out. Yeah, less than 24 hours to completely corrupt it. <laughs> and turn Which it, is, into, it is into, funny, into, actually. Into this, okay, this seems, like, this seems like the topic that we can cover in the mature audiences only segment, but let's get back to Tom and conclude with him. And, of course, Tom, you're welcome to stay after, but... Let's make sure that we've got all of our ducks in a row on the URLs. And I gave a URL earlier, highly controversial URL, because you have to put www in front of republicofthings.com. So sorry. Sorry Hello. about that. Uh, or apparently you do, or Andy was having DNS problems. Anyway, <clears throat> in fact, let me uh, put that back on my, there you go, republicofthings.com. Put a www in front of it and see what happens. Should it work. works without for me. It works without it or with it? It works without for me. Okay, you have uh, several URLs. I don't. Know if, are we missing anything, or how? To, what's the best way for people to contact you and so on? What, let's conclude this. Uh, yeah, easiest way to so easiest way to find me personally is bookofthefuture.co.uk, um, which book will add. <laughs> pardon. Book of the future. We just book, book of the of future. The future. Um, named, named after that, named after that Usborne book that first got me into the whole space, um, or at Book of the Future on Twitter. Right, and um, I was going to, but I'm not quick enough. I was going to put, uh, go, I, I did look at Book of the Future .co.uk, but I don't have it on my browser now, so I can't share that. Uh, Tom, I want to thank you again. You're you're welcome to stay with us and come anytime to our meetings, which are always Fridays at 12 noon uh, EDT Eastern Time, which translates generally most of the time to 5 p.m. UK time. Thanks to Tim for arranging this thing, and we're going to go to what we call our mature audiences only segment, which basically talks to talks about the same things we were just talking about before we stop. Anything, James? No, no, like I've it. lost my must, my moustache has fallen off. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, look at that, and it came back. All right. And thanks to Chris Matthew. Chris, uh, you're always welcome. As I said, we're going to cut off the broadcast, and we are going to continue in our mature audiences only. And we'll be be listening to James 
uh, James is going to do his Cary Grant imitation. Take care, everybody. Thanks, and we'll see you next week. Great show next week. VUC.me.